Hi, everyone. Adam here with a special note. About two-thirds of the way through this episode, we experienced some technical difficulties in recording that were unknown to us at the time. This being the case, you'll notice a distinct change in audio quality at that point in our discussion. However, I felt that Michelle's observations were so forthcoming and raw that it would be a disservice to re-record the episode. Thanks in advance for your understanding. My name is Adam Roberts, and I'm a vocal coach here in the live music capital of the world, Austin, Texas. I'm on a journey to learn the stories behind extraordinary voices of people I know and what makes them unique. Each of my guests has chosen to follow their voice. So this is Cola Voce. Welcome, everyone, to the second episode of Cola Voce. I am so thrilled to be here today with my good friend, Michelle Alexander. How are you today, Michelle? I'm awesome. How are you? I'm well. You are always awesome as far as I'm concerned. And I say that not in like a um, a way that's, oh, Michelle, you're awesome. But seriously, I always have such a big smile on my face when I talk to you. Oh. You're one of those people for me anyway, that just radiates joy. Oh, and right. I'm sure you're not always feeling that. But <laughs> for me, it always comes across as joyful and uh, to be with you and, and to share time and space with you. So thank you so much for being the second ever guest on this episode. Oh, thank you for having me, Adam. I love you. I'm, I'm obsessed with you, actually. So, so, Well, I have to say that that is completely mutual. And when I was thinking about when I was thinking about people whose stories I thought, you know, others would find interesting, I immediately came to Michelle Alexander. And so we heard from Amato, the rocket scientist in the previous episode. And now we're going to hear from Michelle and totally different stories and totally different ways that these two folks came to the voice. So it'll be fun just to chat together for the next hour. Yeah. So, Michelle, we met years ago and have worked ever since on several different productions together, both musical theater productions and straight theater productions, so shows that don't necessarily have music in them. And one of the things I was realizing when I was thinking about this episode today and what we could talk about is I don't know much about your story about how you came to theater and how you came to singing. I only know that you're great at those things <laughs> from having worked with you. <laughs> so, oh, so can you talk a little bit about like how you came to these, how you came to performance? Um, yes. Um, my story is random, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I first was bitten by the bug when I was like in, of course, middle school, but officially in the eighth grade. I went to uh, Cedar Valley Middle School here in Round Rock. And I remember my theater arts teacher, he was like, it was like a big deal to do lip syncs. I remember when lip syncs was like a thing. It's still a thing, yes. I guess, but like yes. for middle school kids, it's like, oh my gosh, you know? So I remember me and a friend, we both were like looking for songs to sing. And my parents had a bunch of karaoke like CDs and they had Motown from like, a long time ago and they were just like the tracks and so one of the songs was eddie kendrick's and diana ross i'm gonna make you love me and i was like yes. no, i want to do this and so i had this one girl i can't remember her name now but but she did it with me and i was eddie kendrick's from the temptations and she was diana ross and the crowd went like wow they loved it and it was like a a gift because we got to do it during lunch the lunch period the lunch schedule so everyone loved it and I was like, it's official. I'm obsessed with being on this stage. So the the same year, we had a talent show. And I was like, I'm going to sing a song from 3LW. Um, like the original Cheetah Girls were, <laughs> were in yes, 3LW. Yes, yes, and yes. it was like their first album. And they, they, they had a song called Ocean, which is like a song you'll probably skip, you know. But, <laughs> but I liked it. It was very smooth and beautiful. So I was like, I want to sing that. And I want to say a poem. So I said a poem called When I Grow Up, and I auditioned with that. And the uh, person in charge of the auditions was like, I love it. And I want you to start the whole show with this poem. 
And then I want you to open the show with your song. And I was like, what? So this was like eighth grade and I did it and I got an uproar. Like it was a good response. And I was like, it's official. I love this. I'm going to do this. Fast forward to high school. And I was in theater in high school. But when I first auditioned for like a musical, I can't even remember the musical. I think it was like Grease or something. I didn't get a call back. I didn't get cast. And I was like, wow. forget it. Forget it. I'm Give done me that teacher's name. Yeah, I like quit. <laughs> I quit the rest of that year. I was like, I'm done with this. Then the next year, they were doing like Cinderella the musical. And I was like uh, obsessed with it because Whitney Houston and Brandy, like that version came wow. out. And I was in high school then. So I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm going to go back and I'm going to try again. And if they say no, I'm done forever. But I ended up being cast. I got a call back and I ended up being cast as the fairy godmother. And okay. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? So like Whitney Houston all the way. So I was like, okay. I was going to say gonna... Whitney Houston, not, a, not bad shoes to fill. <laughs> okay, right? Pressure. But like it was so fun. And my theater teachers were, they're still doing theater there at that school around Rakai. And like they're amazing people. And they saw something in me that I didn't really see in myself then. But they were like always putting me in their shows when I like didn't audition they were like we still want you to be like can you come be this part or can you play this part all the time so it was like in me and then when I was in college I randomly auditioned for the theater department um at ACU and like I didn't know anything about college I have no idea why I chose that school but to be honest it was the pictures and the brochure I was like okay these pictures look cool like I'm gonna just go (laughs) like who I mean I was so young like what did I know about school I didn't even have it in me to I didn't think about going but I went and um I did like a Shakespeare monologue which is like now that I'm I've done theater it's like a no no to like <laughs> do Shakespeare <laughs> at an audition like no you know but I totally did that and I did like Motormouth from Hairspray and they loved it and they like ended up giving me giving me um a scholarship for theater and I was like whoa I'm definitely going to college now you know for theater yeah. arts. so that's like what stuck with me and then when I left college I was like I don't want to stop doing theater so it just was kind of in me but through school like in high school we went to France in choir I hadn't I didn't know a thing about sheet music or anything but I joined choir because I was like I want to go to France like I didn't know anything about music but I was like, I grew up in the church. We were taught to sing. We were supposed to sing. And it was Church of Christ. So it was like no music. So we went by our voices so I could harmonize with anything, you know? So it was just like, just like you could just pick up a tune with whoever. If they could sing, carry a tune. Even if you couldn't, you could pretend like you could. So that's how I got far in musical theater, really, in the beginning. Like, they're like, okay, sing this part. And I'll just sing what I heard them say and like make it sound good. And they would give me notes. And so I would just adjust to their notes. And I did that in high school. But in college, I learned more about like, you know, official sheet music. I remember I cried every day in music theory class. It was so hard for me. Oh. Yes. It was like, wait, you want to do some math? We had to do math with this? Oh my <laughs> God. It, it was, that was when it became a struggle. But, and see, you, you know, did the exact opposite. I was like, the performance classes in college was were the were the moments I was like, I don't know. And but I did my degree in music theory, so like I was all about the music theory classes, the performance <laughs> classes. I was like, oh, I don't know, choir, not sure. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, I remember it. They would be like, oh, that's just a, a half step. That all the kids in my class were so on point, and I was like, oh my gosh, if I missed the day of class. I was lost when I came back to class. I would skip class on purpose. Oh, man. But I, I wouldn't regret it. I don't regret it because it, it really brought me far. So so then you graduate from college. And did you come back to Austin? Because for those people who are listening who may not have a geography of Texas, ACU oh. is Abilene Christian University, right? Uh, Yeah, I went to Abilene Christian. And then after ACU, I went to randomly. I went to Pocatello, Idaho for... <laughs> two summers no way yeah i was uh cast in i think it was idaho repertory theater they randomly which is so funny they were doing all shook up and i had already just done it at acu my senior year so they did it all shook up and so that would be my second time playing it but i played that role three times already but at zoker as well i think yes, right at zoker yeah, I you do that. yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So crazy, but I was like, I know this like the back of my hand, and people would be like, "Gosh, why? How are you already off book?" And I'm like, uh, you know, 
this is my third time doing this, you know? But it wasn't like I was trying to be cool. I just knew it. But yeah, so I was there for that. And I also did Sour Kangaroo there in Susical and uh, Hairspray. I was in Hairspray there. And that was like, Pocatello is like a very, uh, you know, uh, I'm like, how do I say this? Caucasian town? <laughs> um, Shocking. Um, what? Idaho? <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, we stood out like sore thumbs, you know, uh, me and my friends who went, I met I met a lot of people from, like, Alabama who were there for hairspray, and we had a good time, we had a great time. So I lived there for a couple of summers, and then after that, my friends and I, we went to New York, and I was only there for, like, a, a week visit, like, I just went to visit, and then I met with an agency there. And she was like, I want to work with you right away. And she like wanted to sign me. So I called my parents and I was like, hey, mom and dad, uh, I'm not coming home. <laughs> and I just stayed in New York. What? Yes. I like moved there on a whim right out of college. And I didn't have like any money. I thought I did, but I looked at my wallet. I had $20. That's it. I had nothing. But I stayed there probably off and on for like two years. And... My mom eventually was like, you have to come home. Like, you're not doing so well. Like mentally, I, I was like, I'm doing so bad in life. And like, I was I was getting booked in a bunch of shows, but they were like way off Broadway plays, like way off Broadway around the corner, you know, yeah. <laughs> but they were, it was a really good experience. And I remember one time because, you know, I didn't really I was couch hopping. And I remember I went to an audition in. It was in Brooklyn. But I remember I remember going to it and the director um, had me, she gave us lines. She emailed us some lines and was like, bring these lines. And I didn't have a printer. So I memorized all my sides, memorized them. And I went to the audition and I read the lines. Like anytime she needed me to read the lines or do a monologue, whatever, I just did them. And she was like, how do you know all this? And I just say, well, you know, I don't, I don't have a printer, so I just learned the lines. And she was like, oh my gosh, you got the part. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> that was so <laughs> random, but it was my first, like, tour. It was like my first like tour, but we didn't go many places. We only went to like Jersey and different boroughs in New York. But for me, that was a big deal because I'm from Texas, you know, it was a huge deal to me. So I did that for a while. And then after being in New York, like living on the couch, I was like, all right, like my parents were like, just come home. Like you, you went there on a whim. We didn't even know how to prepare for you to go. And, you know, they would mail me like clothes and money and stuff. But after a while, they were like, we can't keep doing this. Like you need a plan. You don't have one. So come home and get a plan. So I went back to Austin and then I just was doing acting from there. And I didn't expect to be so successful here, but I've been pretty successful since then. Uh, I mean, for people who don't know Austin, aren't from Austin, the name Michelle Alexander carries a lot of heft in Austin theater ooh, and performance. I like that. Yeah, well, it does. That's how, it's, it's how I feel. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, a lot of people have said that to me. They're like, well, I've heard of you. You know, I'm so excited to work with you because I've heard, I've heard your name a lot. And I'm like, really? <laughs> I, I appreciate that. You know, I never... Yes. Heard want to have a big head i mean i have a big head but not like <laughs> on purpose because i got round cheeks you know but <laughs> <laughs> so i want to go back to pocatella for a second if we could yes please what was and what was the reception of hairspray like in mm -hmm. pocatella based on i mean you already said you know probably during your off times from rehearsal or performance you're sticking out like a sore thumb what what was the reception of Hairspray like there? Well, you know, I think because it had already been on Broadway, and I think, I don't know if it was a movie at that point, but people knew about Hairspray, so they okay. kind of knew what to expect. But I think we had a hard time casting the show because, you know, I also did hit All Shook Up there, so it was kind of the same vibe. It was trying to find people of color to fill these these roles and they wanted it to be more about race than class if you will but it was a lot of like how are we gonna make this work and so when I wasn't I was woke but I wasn't I don't think I felt comfortable being as woke as I say woke you know but like you know being as informed as I am now about race and everything happening we were having these conversations that were like a little bit uncomfortable 
but I was with some girls from Alabama, so they wasn't like, <laughs> you didn't play, you know? And I'm just, I'm from Round Rock, so it was like very, like, I was very used to being the only person of color in the room. So, I mean, I didn't really fight the battles as much as I could have. There was a lot of things that probably we shouldn't have done, but I think they they just pulled off hairspray with like six, seven black people, <laughs> which I think in reality, you know, it's still enough, sadly. But I think it would have been more powerful with more persons of color, but or they would have like Hispanics be persons of color or you know what I mean? Like people who weren't black, but they weren't white. And it was obvious. And about how many years ago was this? Probably 2000, maybe nine. Okay, Around that time. Just kind of orienting myself to the timeline here. Yeah. And did you, you know, when you go into a situation like that and maybe, you know, this didn't pertain in particular to this production. I don't know. But when you go into a situation where the show itself is about two different, I think about, um, I think it was West Side Story where Jerome Robbins, you know, didn't, didn't allow the cast members who were playing the Sharks to interact with the cast members who were playing the Jets. He didn't want there to be socialization. They couldn't go to lunch together. They couldn't, you know, there was this idea that I, we really want you to feel like a community unto yourself and a community unto yourself on this other side. Something that, you know, hopefully that approach to that kind of, you know, interpretation wouldn't happen today. Like, don't go to lunch together. Right. However, I am curious to know, when you do a show like Hairspray, and the, a story where you know, the the show itself is about two communities. You know, unfortunately, it's does have the white savior narrative to it. As an actor who comes in to that context, do you ever feel like you're part of just the one group? Is it hard to be part of the whole cast socially? Is it harder or is it not for you? Oh, that's a good question. I feel like you know, maybe, maybe I think because of Michelle, the person, like I could get along with a paper bag. So it was, yes. like, yeah. I was getting along with everyone, but I feel like I really wanted to make a connection because there were people in my cast who were of mixed race. And I know that they, as a mixed race person, felt like they were trying to find a place where they belong, you know? And yes. Yes. I was like, you, you can, you belong anywhere. And not because you're a mixed race, but because you're a person, you know? And yes. so I was like, you can hang out with me. Like, it's totally fine. And I just took, and the one who was mixed race, well, two of them were, but one of them was, she played Lil Inez. And I was like, that's my child, like in the script. So I was like, be my child, like be a part of me, you know, you're a part of me. And so we made a connection and I made it like a choice to make sure persons of color in the cast didn't feel because we already felt awkward enough being in Pocatello, Idaho. So it was like, well, I think people who were not persons of color didn't know how to interact with us. You know what I mean? Even if they didn't want to. And then the people who were confident with it, it was like, all right, chill. Like We know that yes. you're cool. we know that you're down. Like you don't have to overexert yourself. Like we know we get it. But I think for a lot of us, including myself, because I went to like ACU and I, you know, I mean, I went to school, I was raised in Round Rock, so it was a very familiar place. Yeah, for people who are listening, Round Rock is a suburb of Austin, if you're unfamiliar with, it's just north of Austin, but very different than than the vibe of Austin as a city, I would say. Yes, very different, very different. And it's come a long way since I was a kid, but like it still has, it still has Round Rock vibes to it but I think even myself growing up in that part of town was like okay I'm in Pocatello but I know I'm in a show where there's gonna be black people so I really want to make sure they know that I'm down you know what I'm saying yes <laughs> I yes. found myself trying like a little too hard in the beginning but after a while we just uh, we became family even persons who were not you know who didn't look like me we were all cool and I felt like we felt safe enough in that place to be that way. And it wasn't until we went to like a bar or like a restaurant that we were like, oh yeah, we're different and we're theater kids. So we're definitely different and we're black. Yeah. <laughs> like intersectionality there. Yes. So it was a lot. I think we had our moments where we all didn't know how to interact, but we found a way to make it work. Yes. That's incredible. One of the things, you know, that I was thinking about this past summer 
was, you know, in, in, in discussions that were happening around race and theater, somebody brought up in a, in a comment, perhaps on Facebook, I don't remember exactly where it was, but just what it, what it feels like to come in to a cast as a person of color from this person's perspective and be the only person of color that is uh, part of that cast. Now, of course, there are some musicals or plays or films that are, are written such that there is one person of color in the cast, but there are also many that are not. And I thought back to, I thought, you know, I have directed productions where that has been the case. You were part of a production that I directed where that has been the case. Yes. And it's, it's, you know, it's something I had never been aware of. And I would never have thought until I read that comment, how othering that must have the potential to feel even under the most aware, if you will, of circumstances that has to feel very othering in some ways. And the production I'm talking about with, with you, um, it was a three person cast and a, a, a show I would, I would say probably didn't necessarily have a lot of definition where the characters had to be from any racial or ethnic background. I'm trying to think back and think if that, if that is true of that show. I can't think of any moment where any of the characters were dictated as being from a specific background. Yes. I just remember um, being cast in that show. Like, I, first of all, I couldn't believe it. And second of all, the fact that you were like, I want you to be, I think her name was Anna. And you were so adamant that it'd be me. And I don't think it was because I was black, but I don't know. But it makes more sense. Like, the more I get to know you, I'm like, I mean, it just points out that you saw so much more in me that I saw in myself even then. And it was like, um, hence this podcast, like the voice, like you just knew that like my voice needed to be heard. And someone else told me that recently, like Austin needs more black voices like you. And I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, like, I really feel like you, your voice is, it can be so underrated. Like maybe people know you, but they don't know, they don't know you, you know what I mean? And I was like, wow. So I really feel like you called me outside of the box a lot and said, prove, prove to them that you can do it. Like you can. And you really believed in me. And I remember someone when I was a teacher, I was teaching theater and I remember someone came to the very last like closing performance we had and I didn't say anything to anyone because I was nervous, you know, but she saw it in the newspaper and she was like, I'm going. She brought her daughter and they sat on the front row and she was like, I was in tears. Like, I just loved it. And I was like, wow. But it was such a moving piece. My parents loved it. So many people really enjoyed that show. And I was like, if, if, it, if we were terrible, they wouldn't have said nothing like good show. You know what I mean? But well, and also I think, you know, this was a, this was a play called the art of remembering. And I think that one of the interesting things about that to, to, to your point also is it's very abstract. It's not a, it's not a play. It's not a script that has a linear narrative that is just very easy to follow. Super abstract. And I knew Michelle that the three people that, were cast in that show had to be able to make such an abstract script feel like your living room. And <laughs> I felt that the three of you really did that. And I feel that the dynamic between the three actresses who play those, those roles in that play, I don't know if that, I don't know if that play had been done since its original production yeah. when we did it in Austin, <laughs> but I felt like the dynamic was so great between the three of you. And I feel like each of you brought so much dynamism from your backgrounds to that piece. And, you know, whatever the characteristics were that played into those things, the experiences were, that to me was the engine of that production. Yes, they they all, I mean, all three of us were so, so different women, but like we got along so well and we just made like a connection from the beginning. Like I love the, uh, they're still my friends to this day. Like that's what I love about theater is that you can really s start a family with whoever you're with. And we really were supportive of each other. I mean, we had to do accents and everything. And I was like, what? Like I was not comfortable at first. I was very afraid. And I was like, I don't want to offend anyone. You know what I mean? But as far as I know, we didn't. And people were like, you were pretty legit, like spot on. And I was like, wow. And shout out to your friend who was friend, the French guy. I don't remember his Rene. name. 
Oh, Emmy. Yes. Emmy. Yes. 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 Really yes. Was so helpful. <laughs> and MJ, she was awesome. Like, and you as well. Like, it was a really good, like, support system we all had. So. Yes. So now I have a, maybe this is a tough question. Maybe it's not a tough question. I don't know, but it's something that I, even before this past summer, when, you know, all of us uh, in the white demographic, you know, well, not all of us, unfortunately, but hopefully most of us in the white demographic realized we need a massive education. I have often been involved in this conversation as a vocal coach about, quote, the black voice. Of, mm. of singers. Is there a black voice? Well, I think for black people, no, but I think to people who aren't black, of course. And I've had so many like notes, like during auditions where they're like, do you have something else in your book? And I've had like people ask me, like, do you have something a little softer? <laughs> and listening to your first episode, I was like, "Oh my gosh, am I am I a Parker and Barker? Like, do I have just park and bark?" And I think, <laughs> you know what I mean. And I feel like, you know, sometimes I might do that. I'm not gonna lie, but like, I think there was a certain like demographic that I was like, if I don't sound this certain way, I may not be black enough for these people who aren't black, but they're casting the show. So I think a lot of times I want to be black enough for the people casting who aren't necessarily black you know and i think for black people i mean i think the beauty of uh just theater in like a black black theater is that you don't have to sound like you're at church all the time you don't have to sing until your teeth shake in order for us to know that you you can sing you know i mean like i said i grew up in the church of christ so a lot of the singing singing wasn't necessarily what i was used to hearing so like growing up with that was very different than this sounds crazy, but like maybe someone who grew up Baptist or something like that, where it was very familiar for them to um, sing a different kind of way in the church, because the way I grew up was like, oh, you sing with music like that's, you know, sinful or certain things. So it was just like, oh, a lot of that, like annoying stuff that got in the way of like trying to make music, you know? So I think for me, I had to, as I grew up, I had to find my black voice and figure out like, what do I sound like? And yes, I'm different than this person and that person. We are not the same when we don't belong in a box. And I, you know, I definitely don't. I'm definitely someone who thinks outside of the box, even when I'm not trying to. But, <laughs> but yeah, I think some black people sound unique. All black people sound unique. And I think some, some white people, I mean, you see a lot of people who want to sound like you, you know, or you want to sound like them, they may not be black, but I mean, singing is singing. It's a gift. You know what I mean? It's truly a celestial thing. And I feel like not everyone is able to do that. And I just feel like grateful that God blessed me with some sort of gift of that. There have been times when I've let people talk me down or talk me out of it because you don't get a part or you don't get the part you want or whatever. And so I'm like, maybe I'm not as good as I thought I was. But then there are people like you, I'm not going to lie, and I'm not trying to gas you up, but I just really mean like certain people who see more in you than you see in yourself. And it's like, man, like I'm my own worst critic. Like who cares what other people think? Like you think you're awesome, then you're awesome, Michelle. Like who cares? (laughs) That's right. And I think the thing too about that is it's like everybody, you know, it's you as a person as much as it is you as a performer, if not more, it's showing up as you. That's what I love about what we do. You know, because I was, I was saying in a class I was teaching the other day, I was, I, I told them, you know, there are going to be 500 other people who can sing the same notes. So yeah, let's do that. But then you might as well not try to be another blank or another blank or another blank as an artist because they already exist. The mm-hmm. only thing we can do is show up as us. And that is like the most profound thing we can do as performers, you know? So it's yeah. nice that the only thing is also the most profound thing, you know? You right, know? right. Yes. I think that's real. And I think, honestly, that's what's gotten me far in theaters because I'm Michelle, but like on stage, I'll be Michelle, but I'll also be whatever the character is asking for. I mean, I'll never forget, like, I was, I don't know, maybe at one audition and one girl came to me and 
she's actually done several things on Broadway now. So I'm like, hey, wait a minute. But she was like, yeah, girl, I went to that audition. And I just was like, what would Michelle do? I just was you the whole time on stage. And I was like, oh, my gosh, am I offended or am I honored by that? You know, <laughs> you know? I don't know how to take that. But it was cool that she was like, I just thought about what you would do in that situation. And I just tried to be you. And I was like, oh, that's cool. But I've never thought of that when I was on stage. Like, I'm going to be like this person. I'm going to do what she does. But I'm just like, how can I... Like tell her story and with my voice, you know? Yes, yes. Well, this is going to sound like mutual admiration episode on this podcast, but it kind of is. Um, because what I was going to say is, Michelle, I think, you know, I've seen you in as many productions as I've worked with you on for sure. Um, and your versatility to me is part of like, I, there, I've seen you in so many roles that I would never have conceived you in, in my head. Yeah. And then I see it and I'm like, she can do, she can pull out whatever, but it's because you bring yourself, you do, you don't factor out the you in any role. And I think that that is oftentimes the obstacle for people who could otherwise be very versatile is trying to transform a thousand percent into, into some other thing that's not connected to them as a person. And I've never seen you perform a role that I, knowing you, didn't see Michelle in, you know? Oh, I love that. I really love that. And that's cool to hear that, like, I'm versatile because I'm not going to lie. Like, I have played some random parts that I never would have thought that I was going to play. But it's been really cool. And you have seen me in some random stuff, like, especially since 2019, especially like random. In one play alone, I was like four or five different people. You know what I mean? I do. I remember. (laughs) So it's like, yeah, that's crazy. Um, but that's an honor to know, like, my acting has been seen as versatile. So that's really cool. From my perspective, anyway, I mean, I mean, for real, yeah. for truly. <laughs> I want to ask you a little bit about a production that I saw. Um, what has it been? Has it been close to two years ago now since Notes from the Field? I guess it's been, wow, it's been yeah. close-ish to that, right? At Zach Theater. Uh-huh. So for those who aren't in the Austin area, Zach Theater is a regional theater that is here in Austin. And the artistic director there, Dave Stakely, has ties with Anna Devere Smith. They're good friends. And so Anna Devere Smith had written a piece called Notes from the Field. And it was originally a piece like many of hers. Correct me if I'm wrong about this, Michelle, please. But I believe it was a piece like many of hers, correct, originally that she performed as a one person or it was performed as a one person piece originally. Uh huh. Yep. And then your version at Zach had four different actors playing the characters as opposed to one person. Correct. Yes. And I believe there was 19 plus characters we played. 19. And all of those characters were actual people. Actual people still living. One of the girls, I'm still friends with her on social media. Really? When I was cast, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to find her and let her know that like she's a shero to me. And I commend her for what she did. And she was like, yeah, girl. So we became friends, you know. So we're friends till to this day. Incredible. Yeah. For those who are unfamiliar with Anna Devere Smith's work, a lot of it is sort of um, ethnographic interviewing. And then depending on the piece, sometimes she sort of takes over, um, you know, the character with her own body and, and her own voice. And in this particular case, again, um, this was a piece. I'll let you, uh, if you don't mind, you, you will describe it better than, than I would, Michelle, but sort of oh, des- no. <laughs> <laughs> describe the piece. And it was one of the most powerful and educational and moving pieces of theater that I have ever taken part in as an audience member or otherwise is not a production I had anything to do with creatively. I was there as an audience member, but I know that when you were doing this production, this is many questions in one. (laughs) I know when you were doing this production, you said that there were people who left frequently in the middle of the production. Could you talk a little bit about what the show itself is? And then could you talk a little bit about your, the, your feelings around that show and what what happened, like you know, people leaving in the in the middle of the show, and 
Can you just talk a little bit about that? Because for me, it was one of the most impactful experiences I've ever had in the theater, made all the more impactful through the events of this past summer, um, and totally thinking about it in a completely different way. So yeah. if you could talk a little bit about that in your personal experience. Well, Notes from the Field is a show about the school to prison pipeline. Like it talks a little bit about how it began and how those people um, got where they are. Some of them by choice, some of them not by choice. And it talks about family members who were raising some of these children who or teaching some of these children and um, you know, scientists. I mean, it had like, you name it, like so many different um, perspectives in the show. And they were all talking about like epigenetics and like a bunch of stuff, like genetics, like so many different things that had to do with um, the people involved. And they talked about stereotypes and police brutality. And I think as an actor, it was hard to be a part of, but it was also just something like when they told us about going to it, we got to go to like a private screening of it at um, Austin Film Studios. And we met Anna DeVere there. She was speaking. And um, that's when I knew, and this was probably the year before they had auditions. And I was like, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to do whatever I got to do to be in this show. Like, I really want to be in the show. I remember that year I cut all my hair off. Because I was like, I just want to be gender neutral because I know Anna DeVere played men and women, you know, children. She played everybody. And I was like, I don't want them to question me out um, because of what I look like, which being black was like a plus, you know. So it was like, OK, so I'm just going to take my hair out of the equation because if it's a problem, they can put a wig on me and call it a day. That's pretty much what happened. And I just remember... After that, after deciding that that's what I wanted to do, I remember auditioning for the show and they had me audition for it, I think, three times. And I was like, you got to do better. Each time I was like, got to do better, get familiar. And it was like every monologue they had me learn um, for the audition and for the show. But for the audition, it was like maybe five plus pages of lines. And I was like, oh, my gosh, there's so many lines. You know, it was just a lot. And I just I'll never forget, like the dry tech and wet tech where we had to watch the videos, you know, and they would be like, okay, cut. We're going to do that again. We're going to make it louder. Um, and so we would have to watch people die right in front of us over and over and over again. And like when these things were happening in reality, like there was a lot of videos, like the George Floyd video, when that came out, like later that next year, I couldn't watch it. Like, I, I think to this day, I haven't seen it. I mean, I've seen what they show on TV, but like, even then I would like look down or change it because it's just like traumatizing after a while. And I think as an actor, like watching that, it was really hard for us. And I'll just never forget, like looking at my knees or looking at my toes and like just looking down because we were just teching it. So it wasn't really about the actors at that point. We were just there and when the show was going in real time, it was like, those were moments were like really genuine. I would grab the other actor's hand and we would look at each other and just be like, man, like it was just like really sad. Like it was just kind of unbelievable that we were seeing this. And my dad, he's a retired Austin police officer. So that was surreal. Like having him and his partner be in the audience, watching these things that we were saying about cops you know, me as an actor who was playing like somebody who was a friend of Freddie Gray when the whole thing happened. He was just like somebody riding in the streets and he was arrested for bashing a cop car in or something. And um, my dad was just like, it was funny, but it wasn't like you played the parts, you found the humor in it, but it wasn't funny. Like it was so real. And I understood those moments. And I'll never forget like over and over people would just leave in droves sometimes like we filled the audience probably like a few times but a lot of times there was several empty seats because people just couldn't hang or they would leave after the group discussions that we had to have we would break out the show in the middle of the show we would break the whole audience into groups and have conversations about what we were just seeing and in my group I always try to make it an effort to say, hey, um, you don't have to talk. You can just sit here and listening. The fact that you even came 
is a big deal because a lot of people won't even do that. Um, and if you stay, I would say, you know, towards the end, there's a couple more monologues and they're a little bit more hopeful than what you've seen. And I mean, I've had people say, what would your dad say about this? And I'm like, my dad would say what I have to say about this. I mean, he doesn't agree, you know, to what's being seen. Like, I think any human would say that this is messed up. This is wrong. What people have done. Um, They're like, well, what can we do? How can we help? And I'm like, well, um, you could vote. <laughs> and I said, it doesn't have to be the big White House vote. You could vote right here in your town, like make a difference in your neighborhoods, you know, like go out and have dinner, have conversations with people who don't look like you, like have uncomfortable conversations because that's where it begins. That's where it starts. And I think a lot of people feel comfortable, you know, saying things and don't even see anything being wrong with that. And I'm like, we, we as black people, and I said that in the beginning when I was like, I was just trying to be friends with everybody. And I think now you have to realize like, not everybody's going to be your friend. Not everybody's going to like you. And that's okay. Really, that's okay. Like, they don't have a heaven or hell for you. So go on and do your thing because it doesn't necessarily matter. Like, lead with love the most as possible, but speak your peace, you know? Um, because I think so many people fought for us to be where we are today. And I think we owe them. Our voices, you know, they, they need to be heard. They deserve to be heard. And I really think that show showed me, like, how important telling these stories are and I think that's why I made an effort to try to reach out to the girl who made the she recorded the girl being yanked out of her seat in the classroom I was like I want to meet this girl and I just found her online I tried to contact Brie Newsome but she's Brie Newsome so you know yeah. um, <laughs> you know I couldn't get a hold of her but I got a hold of Naya Kenny and we're friends to this day you know we're not BFFs but we're good friends like we talk to each other often so I mean, I love her. So, and I really think if I didn't have done that show, I don't know if I would have been able to be brave enough to connect with her. But I was like, I'm telling your story. And I'm so honored to do that. Like, I want to do you justice. I want to make you proud, you know? And to give a little context. Your question. Yeah, I 100% did. To give, a little, to give a little context to some of what you were talking about, you know, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit from my experience walking mm -hmm. into the theater. You know, one of the things about the theater space at SAC, the Clayburg stage where this was performed, is that it's a thrust space. And for those who aren't familiar with that term, who might not be in the theater, it means that there are people, audience members on all three sides. Mm -hmm. And that gives a very different perspective of watching a production because you can see the other audience members who are there with you quite readily. Also, you all were very close. You're literally surrounded by the audience. <laughs> So um, close. So oh. close. And that was something I, I, you know, it was so palpable. And there were four screens of sorts that were above the stage onto which this footage that you're speaking of, Michelle, were, was projected. And the footage that you're describing is, and I don't know how many clips there were, but there were a, a huge number of clips of news clips, of phone clips, of brutal brutal killings yes brutality i that's it's you know and it was all there right in front of your face and and i understand that that's a circumstance that some people cannot stay and sit through and watch i, I understand that it's to me something that i know that i needed one of the most troubling things for me personally as an audience member about watching this show, how many of the names I was unfamiliar with, how many of the stories I didn't know. And so then as soon as you're introduced to one of these characters, frequently throughout the show, then you see the footage of them in real life mm -hmm. um, when they're killed or the footage of them in real life when they're brutalized and beaten. And it's, it's so hard to watch, but I think for people who, who quote, can do it, it's so necessary. And I knew that three quarters or so of the way throughout the show that there were these breakout times when each of the four actors took a quarter of the audience who was still remaining. 
we would sit in a circle and the, the, that actor would lead the discussion. So my friend and I who went, I asked if we could be placed in your group, mm -hmm. um, you know, specifically when we, when we went. And um, so I knew that you would be our, um, be the, the head of our, of our group and discussion. And I thought, oh my gosh, I cannot imagine what it would be like to be an actor in this show already so intimate and vulnerable and playing actual real people mm -hmm. who then see in film get massacred, get um, beaten. And then now you have to go and lead a group of people <laughs> who probably, I don't know, were probably primarily white people in these conversations about what you just saw. I can't even imagine you were so grace filled in that moment. I can't even imagine what it must have been like to lead those groups after performing a piece that had to have been one of the most intense pieces to perform. I can imagine. And then night after night, going back and taking this group of strangers and some people you knew who are mostly white in this show about brutality um, against, you know, our black brothers and sisters and I can't even imagine what was, I mean, you know, and I, the, the, the reason that I wanted to talk about this besides all of the impact that mm -hmm. it has and should have, I think, is also the voice component. Like you said, there is this literal voice that we talked about with your singing and with your acting. And then there's this voice, our voice, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What, what was your voice in that moment? Yeah, um, I think, you know, because like I said, I was playing multiple characters and we did have um, a voice coach come in and give us like tips about how to be like we had Baltimore accents, but she didn't want us to like overdo it. You know what I mean? So give them touches. So I was kind of looking forward to just like talking my normal talk, my voice. And but I also was super nervous. But because I was an educator, I was familiar with leading discussions, especially uncomfortable discussions. And I was I was curious. So I wasn't really like, I don't want to do this. And I know some people in my cast were kind of like, I don't want to do this, you know. But I was and I don't blame them because it is an, an easy thing. And even people going, they were like, I don't want to have these conversations. I don't feel like it. Like, I, I feel uncomfortable enough, like watching it. And so I, that's why I, I would always say like the fact that you're in my group and you're, you're staying to have this conversation means so much because I know how hard it is, you know? So then for us as actors, I was just trying to find moments to ask the audience questions like, what is a moment in the show that stood out to you the most? What is something that you didn't know that now you know about? Um, I wanted to hear their experience, like who they were as people, what they do, and what brought them to the theater. Some of them were really moving. Some people were really just like, I don't know, I'm here because my mom brought me. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and I met a few people like that. And it was interesting to see like young adults, young kids who were like, like they didn't know what to say. They were speechless and they were just like, get me out of here. Like I'm ready for this to be over. And that kind of upset me. Because I was like, you guys are the main people like who need to be impacted by this. I mean, at least that's how I felt. I was like, I was upset about that. That was probably the only time I got frustrated was like, I'm here doing this for you. You think we're comfortable up here? Like, we're not. Like, it was not as comfortable as we. I mean, we didn't expect it to be comfortable. But I know that year I like cut a lot of things out of my life because I just wanted to focus on the task at hand. And that was like. I mean, I'm pretty serious about whatever roles I'm doing, but that was the show that I was like, it deserves my 100% attention and I have to give it that much attention. And so I was like ready to have these conversations, but a lot of people, they played it safe. Like um, they had some people like, <laughs> it was funny. And they told us before we went, like, just, you know, you just say as little as you can and let the audience do most of the talking if possible. And you just get them back on track if they're going off track, but keep it simple. But my group was almost always the group that they were like, Michelle, you have five minutes, Michelle. <laughs> we would always just get there. Yeah. You remember like we would always be talking and like getting so into it, but I don't know how many times like people in my group would like argue or someone would say something ignorant that they didn't think was ignorant. And somebody else in my group would be like, 
um, excuse me, and they would call them out on stuff, and I would just be sitting there like, well, I didn't have to do nothing. Like, they would already, <laughs> you know what I mean? They would fight your battles for you because they felt like this is my time to speak up against what maybe I'd never spoke up against. Like, I, this is my chance to prove that I, I'm, I, I'm on your side. I understand. And that was cool. That's all that we, you know, could ask for, you know. And there were some moments where it felt like people would be like, that was an interesting play. Like, okay, so what's for dinner? Like, they would just move on, like, you know, move on with their life. And so I really wanted it to resonate with more people. Um, so when people were leaving... It really upset me, but I, I I had to take it as like they don't think we're bad actors. We're good actors because if we weren't, they would be still sitting in them seats. I think, but I think they were just disappointed, like in themselves. Maybe they felt shame, yes. and so they got out of there because that guilt was strong. And so, they, well, knowing that you're going to have to go talk about it in a group setting. Yes, I think that's why they were like, "Okay, I'm getting out of here before before it's too late. Let's just go," no. you know. No. And I don't blame them. And I think they were like disappointed with Zach, perhaps maybe because they do a lot of like musicals and singing, you know. And so I think they were like, "Well, this isn't like a shuck and jive kind of show. This is what we expected, but." They're definitely uh, giving it to us, and we definitely did. And I, I love Anna Devere because she wrote everything down, and she, we had to learn it verbatim, like word by word, like every um, uh, every pause, you know, everything was exactly the way it was written. And we would get lo- line notes like, um, you forgot the um here, and you forgot the and here, and I'm like, golly, like, just be glad that I got the whole monologue. So it was like. <laughs> It meant a lot to me to get those lines. So when people were not like feeling it the way that I was, I mean, over time, I now understand it because I'm like, they're not you. It means something different to you maybe than it meant for them. But the fact that people went, you know, I think this as much as I could ask, I guess, you know, so. Well, you were the, these people's voices by proxy. That's, yeah. that's carrying a lot of weight on your shoulder. Yes, indeed. It definitely was a lot of weight, and I think it's crazy because I was like, you know, I would just go home, and like, there was no way. I don't think I went to sleep. Like, I mean, luckily I had I had quit my job to focus on acting at that point, but I was like, there's no way that I could be like, okay, class, the next day. Like, I I don't know how I could have taught class, you know. But yeah. a lot of my students came to see that, and I was like, they they were the main people that I wanted to come see that because of the environment where I was. I think a lot of people who I maybe have seen like in other situations, I'm like, oh, I'm glad that they came. But some of them didn't stay. You know what I mean? I mean, as I said, it was just for me one of the most impactful um, uh, experiences. I think that's truly what theater can do. Yes. Um, It doesn't have to do that all the time. Right, Um, exactly. You can do that. And that was an example of that to me. So thank you for for that experience all around. Um, Thank you for going to that. Yes. yes. Well, we have close to reach the end of our time together, and we have talked about so many incredible things. I just, um, this is going to stay with me, you know, for for a very long time. I can't wait for people to hear it. I want to end with a little segment um, that should be kind of fun. Okay, okay. That is called... Voice memos. Ooh. Ooh, ah. Tell me what you know. Tune in into voice memos. So, voice memos is a set of ten questions. Oh, gosh. I'm going to ask you about your favorite blank. So that you can answer. Um, and you have not seen these questions, I know. So this is going to be 100% spontaneous. <laughs> and we all know that we have different answers to our favorite anything on a given day. So these are today's favorites off the top of Michelle's head. Are you ready? Oh, uh, I think so. Sure. Yes, <laughs> nice yes. Number one, the favorite score you've ever sung from, Michelle. Oh, gosh. The favorite score I've ever sung from, I think, would probably, this is so random, and I'm sure I think of others, but the one that I, that came to my head off the top was Aida. 
I played I played Nehebka, but I mean, and I loved that part of Nehebka and the fact that she was willing to die for her sister. Aida, love it. Favorite hymn. Oh gosh, uh, there's a song called "I Won't Complain," and it's like uh, I'm like I can't even think of the words right now, but. Um, I need to sing that song to remind myself. <laughs> okay, I won't complain. I know, like, John Legend does a version of it that's amazing. And um, I sang it at my grandfather's funeral. And my, at first, my dad was like, don't do that. Don't do that song. Because, like, people are complaining because he's gone. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Bad idea. But off the top of my head, I definitely think of that. I can name several. But that but I'm like, what's the first thing? I, I don't know like, it. I have to go listen to it. Yes, now. listen to it. It's very good. Your favorite class you've ever taken on any subject? Favorite class I've ever taken on any subject, I would say is improv. Uh, Took a lot of improv class in college, and that's how I realized. I mean, you know, I'm humorous, but I didn't know, like, it can be, I guess, planned, but not planned at the same time. Like, certain themes you can go off of. And that was just a lot of fun to just do what we're doing now in a way like thinking off the top of our heads and just like seeing what comes up how much stuff is witty and how much stuff is like sit down girl that's take some seats <laughs> you know <laughs> that ain't good but um i learned a lot about myself by taking improv class amazing what about your favorite vocalist my favorite vocalist oh these questions i know oh my gosh um oh yeah i have to name one so i'm i would say Billy Holiday. Uh-huh. I know that's so random, but Billy Holiday. I mean, she talk about a story. That woman's story, and I just I haven't finished it though. But she has um, America versus Billy Holiday. I think it's what it's called. Uh-huh. It's on Hulu, and how you know she got in so much trouble for singing "Strange Fruit." And I remember as a kid being so enamored by the words to that song. And this was like years after it was done and years after she was gone. But man, like just her as a vocalist. And I think about singers today. I can name a few who I think remind me of Billie Holiday. And I think she is somebody that I just, I look up to so much. Like, whoo, I love her. I love, that's my sister. Who doesn't? Oh my. Nobody shouldn't. That's the case. Yes. <laughs> Two geographical ones. Okay. Your favorite country you've ever visited? Oh, my favorite country. I visited two, but I think, honestly, I, I visited Africa, and that was, as a black person, it was an amazing experience to see people that look like you everywhere you went. If I saw a white person, I was like, what is they? What are they doing here? Like, how did they get here? Like, <laughs> yes. Incredible. And what about your favorite city you've ever visited? Oh, favorite city. I would say Colorado. My brother got married in Colorado and that was just such a like beautiful. We we were in the middle of the Rocky Mountains. And so it was like, isn't that in Colorado? I don't know. Oh, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. OK, so do you, know, do you remember the name of the city? Um, Allensville or Allens Park, something like that. Wow. And it was just like beautiful. It was so earthy like humble, like lodges everywhere and creeks and rivers. And we hiked and it was just like the best experience of my life. Like I loved it. Phenomenal. (laughs) What about your favorite popular song? Oh, goodness. Okay. Oh my gosh. Well, it just came out and I don't really even know what it's called. It's like, keep the door open. And it's yeah, Bruno okay. Mars and, and yeah. Anderson Pack, And I just, yeah. Bruno Mars is such a great singer. Like, first I of mean, all, he's underrated. He is. And so him and Anderson Pack, who I also love, they made a song called Keep the Door Open. And it's just like, it's such a smooth, like, um, song. And it's fu- it's fun. And it just came out. But, I mean, it'll be a summer banger, like, for sure. If it's not already... It's going to be popping by the summer, I promise. Fantastic. Yeah. And along that line, what about your favorite musical style? Ooh, I would say rock music, rock shows. I love, like, this is so random, but, like, Jesus Christ, Superstar, actually. Um, Like, I don't know, but I love that. Like, I know when I was a senior in college, I sang 
Judas, the, the, one of the, she had several songs in that musical, but I sang one of them, Heaven on Their Minds. Yeah. Because I just love, I just, I don't know, something about rock music, telling stories. There's so many, like, oh my gosh. It, Waitress isn't a rock musical, but it's like modern. You know what I mean? I yeah, think like yeah. modern pop songs in music. Oh, nice. So rock pop. I'm going to say rock pop. Love it. Love it. <laughs> That's a good segue to number nine. We're almost there. Okay. Your favorite musical. Ooh, my favorite musical. Oh my gosh. I think I already said it, but I love yeah. Waitress. Waitress the musical. Yeah. So good. Yeah. That's a good one right there. And I know a lot of people don't like it. Believe it or not. What? But how can you not? Like, it's just so good, and you'll cry, and like, sugar. I, like, I just love, like, <laughs> oh, like, it's just so good. It's a good musical. And there's so many, I can name so many, but that's the one that came to my head that I really love is Waitress. Waitress. Yes. And number 10, your favorite podcast host. Oh, of course, Adam. It has to be you, Adam. So. Yes. Admire each other enough. Thank you for playing voice memos. Oh, yeah. Before we get back to our interview, a big shout out to Riley Wesson for editing this episode, Scott Ferguson for graphic design, and Jay Quinton Johnson for writing and performing the voice memos theme. Voice memos! Well, Michelle, as I said when we started off, it has been such a privilege, a privilege to be your colleague and to be your friend. And I cannot imagine a theatrical life in Austin that did not involve you as an audience member or as a colleague. And I am just so grateful for your presence here in Austin and your presence here today. Thank you so much for your experience and for your vulnerability and for sharing everything that you have. Oh my gosh. Thank you for having me. I knew, I didn't think it would be this fun. Well, actually I did think it would be this fun, but I didn't know <laughs> how, yeah, I didn't know how much fun. I mean, it's easy to get lost in conversation with you. So I just really appreciate you seeing me as an artist and as a friend and bringing out the creativity in me in general. So I love well, you. I love it. I love you. Yeah. God bless you. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you. We'll see you, everyone, next time on episode three of Cola Voce. Thanks for joining me on today's episode of Cola Voce. And until next time, remember, follow your heart and follow your voice. <laughs>